the staggering text that I have been assigned to. Wondrous, wondrous words that the Holy Spirit gave to the Apostle Paul to write to these brethren, our brethren in Rome, there who needed their the eyes of their heart enlightened and their understanding enlarged uh, because of the circumstances that they were in. They needed to see more than what they saw when they had first believed. And so God had granted the Apostle Paul to write to them and to, to declare these things of God's righteousness, of his righteousness, the things that our God had done. That they had heard before. They'd heard these things before. You've heard these things before. And yet, we are drawn to them. They, they are attractive to us. Amen. They taste good. For we have tasted of the Lord and know that He is good. And so, so we seek to have these things more and more. This text that is so familiar to us. Of all the, of all the texts about our Savior's death, His sacrifice, the price that He paid... Uh, this is one of, the, one of the most prominent texts that we think of. God demonstrated His own love to us in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just before that text, Paul says, while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for a good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The length of with the height and the depth of this thought. It's a staggering, it's a staggering thing to consider. Our God being willing to extend himself in this manner, to show us, that's what a demonstration is, is it shows us something. Uh, we are amused and inundated with the infomercials, the infamous infomercial, from everything from cookers to uh, hair care products to uh, other things that are not worth mentioning, huh? That are sold to us and demonstrated to us on and on and on and on about how, how can we live without this? How can we function any further in the kitchen or in the yard or demonstration? Our God demonstrated His own love to us. Not like human love that is fickle. Upon which you, upon which we know we cannot count sometimes because of our broken, sinful, wicked, selfish nature. Though we want to demonstrate love to our spouses, to our children, we know that we fail. We know that we fail. I speak of that with a lot of experience. We do not measure up to what we want in that demonstration. Our God does. He does not fail to show us these things of his own nature. He set out for centuries, centuries, planning all of the details and speaking about some of them, didn't he? Spoke about those things through the prophets, many portions, times, and ways. Told us about these things. Those prophets wanted to look into these things. They knew. They knew what God was doing was wondrous. And they wanted to see the enormity of it. They wanted to also see the details of it, didn't they? They wanted to know the time and the person, the place. The Spirit of Christ in them was indicating. It's 
Spirit of God in them was indicating when he spoke about the Christ. But God was keeping it and increasing the anticipation for this great demonstration that he himself would do. Man was not capable, not capable of, of joining with him in it in a constructive way. Although man did join in it, didn't he? Yes, we did. God's word declares this to us, these things, this, this staggering and amazing, wondrous deed, event that took place. The city of Jerusalem, the city of God, the place where God put his name. God demonstrated this event of redemption, salvation, and reconciliation. But of course it didn't look like that, did it? It didn't appear to be that way. How, how could this be? Those with a heart for God's truth long to look into these things, don't we? And to see these things more clearly. Beyond what current religious culture has described as the passion, although that's powerful, isn't it? I couldn't bring myself to go see that. I didn't want it to ruin <laughs> what my faith has granted me. Just a personal decision of mine. What God has demonstrated cannot be replicated. Though it may be dramatic and persuasive and powerful in many ways, it cannot be replicated. One must have faith to see these things. You cannot see them because they've been replicated and put together in digitized form and reproduced on a screen for us. They can only be seen by the eyes of the heart. And the heart that's willing, that's willing to take hold and understand the things that God's demonstration has given us. You see them by faith, by faith. In this letter, the Apostle Paul declares to these Roman believers about the one who was declared to be the Son of God by power, with power, by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ, our Lord. This righteousness robed in grace and truth in this man, Jesus of Nazareth. This man who came to demonstrate, he was sent from God's presence to demonstrate these things to us, to show them to us. So that among all the other things on that day, the last great day, None will say, none will be able to stand before God and say, but I didn't know, but I didn't understand. No, none will say such a thing. Because of this demonstration, it cannot be missed unless you choose to turn away and not look at it. That's the only way it can be missed. It is, it is powerfully clear. It, 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 it overpowers the heart if you are willing. Yes. If you are willing to have this faith that God has once for all delivered to the saints. These things could not be delivered to a man. Moses, Elijah, Ezekiel, as powerful as they were, strong in the word of God, telling us wondrous and showing us, demonstrating, didn't they? Demonstrating great things of God to us. But not this. Not this. No ordinary, no ordinary man could deliver this, this truth, this aspect, or 
not just an aspect, but the, but, but the largeness, the largeness of God's own nature to recover humanity and to bring them back to himself again. No one could do this except one from God's presence, yet no angel could do it. No angel. Because you see, what God was doing is reconciling the world to himself. And so it had to be one made like us. Nothing from the earth could do it. The blood of bulls and goats. No. It had to be one made like us. And he was willing, wasn't he? To be made like us. We've heard about this. Nazarene who walked the earth from Nazareth to Jerusalem on both sides of the Jordan River. All of these things that he did to fulfill God's will, walking among these people who had been, who had been cultivated and cultured and made ready by the things that they had participated in down through the generations and centuries according to the promises made to their fathers. All the things that were granted to them in the tabernacle, the priesthood, the things that were glimpses of this ultimate demonstration that was coming. These were small, tiny glimpses to whet their appetite, appetizers, if they were willing. If they were willing. They had, to, they had to have a hunger. They had to have a desire. They had to, as the teacher said, ask, seek, and knock for these things, these things from God. And yet this righteousness from God that the apostle writes about here in this first section of his letter is not for information only. No. It's a communication from the heart of God to the heart of man. Amen. Demonstrating to us the human condition by which we stand helpless and hopeless before God in that condition. Yet God is willing. The judge of all the earth was willing. Though he could have expelled us from his presence and cast us off forever and be done with a whole lot of them. But he was not willing. He was not willing. His image was stamped upon us. His name is wrapped up in us, in humanity, in Israel. So in some sense, God is set about to Redeem his name. Isn't that what he said to the prophet Ezekiel? For the sake of my name, he's going to do this. this. This great demonstration of himself. To show them. To show them, but to show heaven as well. For there is a great audience of heavenly persons watching. Watching. Interested and want to know these things about the Most High that they do not yet know. So in great wisdom... To enhance his name, to teach angels, and to transform enemies into children who are zealous to do good deeds for his name. He works to redeem humanity from his own curse, which we deserve. The apostle writes about all of these things here in this first section of the letter. All of the things that humanity has done to worship and serve the creature rather than the creator in various and sundry ways, Jew and Gentile alike, turning away from God. But in this redemption, in this great wisdom, our God is willing to re-enroll or to enroll for the first time, of course, in, this, in these things. For this is the first time it's been fully revealed. He's willing to enroll, to engage us, not simply to write our names down, but to personally involve us in these things that he is doing. If we are willing, if we are willing, 
to believe this demonstration of his own love. Could such a thing be? Many would say it couldn't. How could this be? How could one like God come to ones like us and do this great and wondrous thing? It cannot be. Can it? Would he? Could he? The Father was able and willing to extend his mercy and wisdom to humanity if we would come. He began, we know you all are so familiar with this, he began doing these things specifically, directly, of course, in the father of faith, Abraham, his family, that clan that traveled, called him, go, he says, from your family, from your country, to land which I will show you. Seven times, God says. Seven times, he says there in that short statement in Genesis 12, 1 through 3. What I will do, I will do this. I will bless you. I will make you a blessing. I will give you this land. This is what God was doing. If Abraham would believe, of course he did, and became the only human being on the face of the earth, as far as we know, as far as the record is concerned, who was called the friend of God. Friend of God. Traveled with his clan from Ur of the Chaldees across Canaan, down into Egypt, back into Canaan again. 25 years they waited. 25 years he waited. His faith tested. Extending himself in various and sundry ways. Now that day, outside of his tent, he saw three men walking. He recognized, because of his tenderness toward God, he recognized these were messengers of the Most High. He invited them to come and sit in the shade of his tent. Sarah, prepare a meal for them. He began to speak with God, God with him, directly, personally, about the things, the promises. Sarah was listening. This promise, again, comes again. It's been 24 years. God said this time next year. This time next year. See how God, he, he, uh, he works in us, he works through us, he brings us to the place, the, the time of fulfillment. He made Abraham aware it was about to happen, all the anticipation that was building in this man, 99 years old, his wife, 90, 89 years old, and she laughed to herself. One year later, she was not laughing. Most likely, she was weeping in joy, wasn't she? Yes. God fulfilled his promise. The depth, the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments. This is what he was doing in Abraham, in that child, in that young man, Isaac. The child of promise. The inheritance was not in Ishmael. No, send out the woman and the child. Send them away. Staggering thing. Just a few weeks ago, we were talking about that in one of our evening assemblies, and I could see it on the faces of the grandparents and great-grandparents there when I mentioned that. And just, oh my, oh, how? How could? I, I guess they'd never thought of it that way before. I said, this is the wisdom of God working to give to, to tell us, to teach him, or to teach us about his, his will, his purpose, and his desire. That it is not of this earth, it cannot be fulfilled in our affluence, and in our comforts, and in all the things that we've managed to uh, generate, and create, and maintain for ourselves here in the good old USA. These things that God is doing has nothing to do with Social Security or Medicare or our IRAs or our Kios or whatever you want to call those 
things that nest eggs supposedly that we create and provide for ourselves. No, no, that's not what it's about. It's about us believing the wisdom of God and his will and his purpose to bring us to himself. hope against hope, Abraham believed, in order that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which had been spoken. See? That which had been spoken. God himself promised these things. Brethren, we know, don't we? Even, even in these things that we meet to speak about during this short three days, it's all based upon that which has been spoken. We have no eyewitnesses who brought us physical evidence here to tell us about these things, do we? No, no things that have been spoken and we have chosen to believe them. I emphasize to the brethren, they're in commerce all the time. Everyone believes something. Something. Something about our economic might and power. Something about our personal education, our career. Something about our political system. Something about our social net. Everybody believes something. We have chosen to believe these things that have been spoken by the Most High God through His apostles and prophets. And we meet to speak about them again and again and again and again to undergird, to strengthen, to enlarge our faith in these things because it's, it's larger than what we first imagined. Larger, larger than what we know. At this present time, we want to see more. In due course, God granted Abraham that son, and God continued to work in and through them as they dwelt there in that land of promise and tents. Of course, we know, don't we, that Abraham really knew that there was more than just that land. Yes. This promise of God, Abraham saw more than, his descendants maybe, their view was limited to real estate, but Abraham's was not. <laughs> he was looking for a city whose maker and builder was God, and it wasn't that Jerusalem, although that was part of the promise. God continued to engage them in faith. Next, of course, by that almost overpowering command. Take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. Looking to the promise and trusting what had been spoken. This elderly man with his servants and his son went to that place. He laid the wood on his son's back. Well, the image of this is almost overpowering, isn't it? When you think of what was really being demonstrated here. He took the fire in his own hand with the sacrificial knife. And they went together to the place to sacrifice. And he said to his servants, We shall return. Yes. Amen. Father, here is the fire and the wood. Where is the lamb? God himself shall provide a lamb. This is what's been shown to us. This is what's been revealed to us. And in the course of those events, of course, only the angels crying out twice stayed Abraham's hand. The Holy Spirit tells us he received him back. He received him back from the dead. And God, because of his purpose and his will, promised Abraham, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord. There was no one greater. By myself I have sworn. 
Because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, indeed, I will greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the stars, the heavens, the sand which is on the seashore, and your seed shall possess the gate of their enemies. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because you have obeyed my voice. The Apostle Paul in his writing here now appeals to these brethren and he speaks to us down through the generations. Not for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him, but for our sake also, to whom it will be reckoned as those who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He who was delivered up because of our transgressions was raised because of our justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in the hope of the glory of God. Now, the apostle goes on and enlarges that, and he reinforces that, in their minds, in their thinking, in their, in, in, in their daily experience of living by faith. And he says, and not only this, that God has done this, this is how he's called us to himself, this is how he's transformed us, this is how he's transacted this, this, uh, this legal demand of his own nature, and yet, it's more than a legal demand. Because what our God does here appeals to the heart, the willing heart. Yes, this demonstration of his own love. Amen. I want to emphasize, highlight, bold that word, his own love. Not like any other. Abraham's obedience of faith is a picture of heaven's own sacrifice providing the lamb for himself. To establish his own name again above every other name. God knew what he was doing when he made the earth and put us here and stamped his own image on us though we turned from him. He knew what he was doing and all of heaven knows now. And the attention of all of heaven is focused on that demonstration. Still focused. This day, this moment, this instant on that demonstration of the lamb that was slain. It is seen the apostle saw him at the center of the throne. And all of heaven falls before him and confesses his worthiness. Him who was made sin, who knew no sin, was made sin to be on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Let me read that again. <laughs> he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness for by his wounds you were healed, just as the prophet said. Just as the prophet said. For all sin and fall short of the glory of God, be justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness. Because in the forbearance of God, he passed over sins previously committed. Someone might say, wait, 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 wait. What about this sin? What about this sin? Here's the demonstration of God's righteousness. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who had faith 
in Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's, the, there's the invitation. There's the appeal to us, for we know him, don't we? We're familiar with when he walked the streets of Jerusalem, the roads of Judea and Galilee and Samaria, the Decapolis and Perea. We're familiar with the things that he did when he rode in the boat across Galilee time and time again, when he sat on the hill speaking to the crowds, when he got out of the boat and the gathering demoniac met him and fell on the ground before him, when he entered the synagogue in Capernaum and the man who was demon-possessed cried out, Jesus, what do we have to do with you? Have you come to destroy us before the time? We are familiar, aren't we, with when he was sitting in Simon's house. And the woman, whom we know not, came, entered, intruded on that private dinner. A woman who would never have been allowed nor invited. And yet she intruded and found the teacher and made her offering made her offering to him because she saw a demonstration that maybe no one else in the room or few in the room had seen at that point. She saw, she saw this demonstration. See, it's, it is legal. It's a legal matter that must be resolved of justice and righteousness and truth. And yet the great heart of our God extends itself to us in mercy and in kindness and in peace and in its demonstration of his own love. Amen. His own love. Unless he acted. Unless he acted, we would have no hope. There would be no help, nothing in ourselves. No place that we could find intellectually, psychologically, emotionally, physically, spiritually. Nothing in ourselves, any dimension of our nature quivers and cowers before the presence of the Most High God. But this one from heaven comes, walks the earth, he touches the unclean, and he says to the leper who appeals to him, if you are willing, you can make me clean. He touches, he touches an unclean man, and he is no longer unclean. He speaks a word. There's no method to this. There's no system, a secret word, or uh, some phrase. Not at all. It's his will that he extends to broken and diseased humanity to recover us. Those who are willing. Those who believe the demonstration. You know, of all the kinds of demonstrations that we see in our current media saturated generation, you still have to believe, don't you? You still have to decide, is this true? Is this real? Will it do what it says it will? Well, some ask the same questions about God's demonstration of his own love. Is it? Is it? When he acted in the fullness of time, when he sent forth his son who was born of a woman and born under the law, that he might redeem those who are under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. God used time, he used human circumstances to bring everything to the point where it was right and Jesus entered the body of the Virgin Mary, Nazareth was given into the care of the godly, humble Joseph. They arrived in Bethlehem and the time came. And she brought forth her firstborn son. 
as the angel had said. Eight days later, they appeared in Jerusalem to the godly Simeon and Anna, who confirmed the things that were spoken, these sensitive, willing, godly people who were glad for what they saw God doing. They spoke about it to one another. Anna, you could not keep her mouth closed. She went and spoke to everyone who was looking for the redemption of Israel. Yes. Amen. We don't know how many delivered this message that he has come. He has come. This demonstration. She'd seen it with her eyes. Simeon, now Lord, let your servant depart in peace. For mine eyes have seen your deliverance. We needed that demonstration because of the fear of God. We will not come near, will we? For fear of destruction. Terror. We're, there's a lot of talk about terror in our land today. People living on the edge, especially in certain parts of our country, frightened, seeing armed police in the streets, the barricades, all of those kinds of things of terror. We know, don't we, that by comparison, that's not terror. No, that's not terror compared to what we're speaking about here, standing in the presence of the almighty God. No protection, no firearms, no body armor, no intelligence to figure out and to outwit. None whatsoever. When we think about standing before the presence of our God, the guilty human heart must have proof of safety and acceptance. And it cannot come from someone else made like us. It must come from him. God knows this. And so he sent his son. He sent this one whom people had to believe. Could this man be he? The people there in Jerusalem said. Do the rulers know that he is the one? They, they confronted him. How long will you keep us in suspense? Tell us. And he said, I did. They had to choose to believe. They had to decide. Based on God's demonstration. He said himself there in John 10, six months before his death. The Father has given me commandment to lay down my life and to take it up again. He said to them there in Jerusalem that last week when you've lifted up the son of man see and they said how can you say the son of man must be lifted up we have heard out of the law that Christ is to remain forever see we would not know humanity would not know even when even when viewing the demonstration even when standing at the foot of the cross they would not know those who loved in their hearts were broken Beyond expression. Those who hated him could do nothing but express their revilement and their rejection of him. None knew. None knew what the Father and the Son worked together. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Son, behold your mother. Mother, behold your son. All of these things, see, the father and the son were doing together. Truly I say to you, this day you shall be with me in paradise. The father's entrusted all judgment to the son, that all may honor the son, even as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father. This is what they were doing, see. This is what they were doing. 
these things that he spoke from the cross, this demonstration. The, the priest went back to Pilate. Don't write the king of the Jews. Write that he said I am. Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. Well, those words could come from heaven's throne, couldn't they? Yes. This demonstration. There would be no mistaking unless you rejected it, unless you purposely, with your whole heart, turned, which some did, and many still do. In their religious robes and turbans, they turned their back on this demonstration of God's own love. They could not receive it. Their hearts were hard and calloused. They were unwilling. They were unwilling to see the extent to which God would go because it demands too much. It demands too much, doesn't it? Of a faithless heart. Yes. Of a hardened, calloused, and stony heart. They cannot, they cannot give. They're beyond. It's beyond their capacity to give and respond. But it's not beyond human capacity. Because of the power and the wisdom that is in that demonstration of his righteousness and truth, of his mercy and his peace. Hear the tender-hearted question of yearning and appeal. Wilt thou not thyself revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? The psalmist asked that. And then in anticipation, he continues to write, Show us thy loving kindness, O Lord, and grant us thy salvation. See, the tender heart appeals to God in that way. Even as our brother Job spoke about these things. That man with no Bible spoke from a distance, sought these things that God would do, how, how he could, only the Spirit of God. Only the wisdom of God working in a heart of faith could see these things. I will hear. Listen to faith reason to itself. I will hear what God the Lord will say. Amen. For he will speak peace to his people, to his godly ones. But let them not turn back to folly. And then he continues to write with confidence about the revelation of God's wisdom, to do what is right for his name and to show mercy to those who are lost but want to return. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him, that glory may dwell in his land. Loving kindness and truth have met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. Truth springs from the earth and righteousness looks down from heaven. Indeed, Amen. indeed, the Lord will give what is good. And our land will yield its produce 30, 60, and 100 fold. <laughs> Righteousness will go before him and make his footsteps into a way. Now, brethren, we know where that way leads, don't we? And we know how to walk in it because he has blazed that trail for us. And all we have to do is follow. And we do it gladly, with joy, following in the way, the straight and the narrow way that ends at his presence. Amen. It ends before him. Amen. That's the destination. Amen. And that, the Holy Spirit tells us that is our destiny. Because God keeps his promises. And he's demonstrated it to us, hasn't he? His own love. His own love. He has demonstrated to us a way that our Savior blazed in life, death, resurrection, his ascension, and his present ministry. What he's doing right now. How he's ministering to our hearts and in us grace and mercy as we seek it from him.
abundant and overflowing to provide what we need so that we may come into his presence and speak. Here and now and there and then. Speak of the excellency of him who has called us out of darkness and into his marvelous light. The apostle, I'll end with these words of the apostle Paul there, that he speaks right after our main text. He writes, much more than. Having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him.